don't know if you read in the news in the last couple of days, um, but I certainly did. I'm always interested in the in the things that surround what's been what's come to be known as Black Friday and the shopping that occurs on the day after Thanksgiving. Michelle and I went out and shopped on the day after Thanksgiving one time, and I can't remember how long ago it was, but I know it was before we had children. And, and I said then, I'll never do it again. <laughs> if I have to pay double, I'll just buy half as much. I'm not going to buy. <laughs> but I know a lot of you love it. My sister loves it. She left at about midnight, I think, and started shopping. I imagine Wendy Mitchell left before then. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, it's a great sport to many people. But it's also a reflection of of our culture. And it's certainly not bad to be a bargain hunter. Probably it's a very good thing to be a bargain hunter, to steward your money wisely. But it is bad to get the value of your life from material possessions. It is unquestionably a bad thing to judge the value of your life, the quality of your happiness, based on what you possess, based on the checks that you can write, or the bills that you can pay. We're in a difficult economic time in our country. The number of people who have close to not enough or not enough at all is growing. It's growing every year, more this year than last year, more last year than the year before that. A lot of people are having difficult times. My brother-in-law got laid off and has been out of work for several months now. And I know that most families in this room have experienced things very similar to that. And that's why I want us to look at this passage from Luke chapter 16. Because of the perspective that Jesus gives us on wealth and poverty. And it's very, very interesting to see how Jesus gives this account of this rich man and Lazarus. And the priorities, the values that are reflected in how Jesus tells of these events. It's always been an interesting account, an interesting part of Scripture. I heard a preacher talk about it one time and he said, for just a brief moment, Jesus pulls the cover off, and gives us a look at the afterlife. And it is one of the most interesting passages in the Bible because of the vision that it gives in what happens after death. But it's also interesting to see how Jesus described these two men before they died. And I want you to look at that. Look here in verse 19. We'll back up to verse 14 first and look at the context and exactly who Jesus is talking to. Verse 14, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at them. The Pharisees loved money. And they listened to the things that Jesus was saying. They listened to the things that he said about giving the other man your coat if he asks for it. If somebody demands something of you, then go the extra mile. If somebody slaps you on the cheek, then turn the other to him also. He tells people, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The Pharisees were scoffing at what Jesus taught. They were scoffing at what Jesus said, and Jesus understood their love of money. And you come down to verse 19. And he recounts the story, recounts the facts of the rich man and Lazarus. He says, now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, and joyously living in splendor every day. When we were in Israel last summer, I learned something that I found exceedingly interesting. I guess it was this summer, not last summer. About purple. I've always heard about purple and purple being a symbol of royalty in the Bible and it being a, an indication of great wealth. But where purple dye came from 
in the time of Jesus and all the way back to the time of Solomon and David was from a little fish, an actual little shellfish, out of the Aegean Sea. The Aegean Sea is not just right there in the Mediterranean by Israel, but all the way over by Greece. And they have to pry these shells open, and they get just a little bit of ink out of, out of each shell. And so you have to have hundreds or even thousands of these little shellfish that you then have to pry open to get just a few drops of dye to dye one piece of fabric. So it was incredibly labor intensive, incredibly expensive, and from a long way away to get any purple. And Jesus chooses purple or focuses on the purple that this man wore. It also says that he dressed in fine linen. The word here translated fine linen comes from a word, busos. Busos is only used twice in the New Testament, but it refers to exactly that, a fine linen. But this is not just any fine linen. It refers to, in fact, in some places it was called, I wrote this down, woven air. It was so light and so fine that they called it woven air. The Egyptians used this linen for their burial coverings. They used it in their mummification process. And they wrapped people in this extremely fine linen before they buried them. This rich man couldn't wait. He's wearing it before he ever dies. And notice that he doesn't just have purple. He doesn't just have fine linen. He also says, Jesus at the end of verse 19, joyously living in splendor every day. Joyously living in splendor, the word means radiant, magnificent. Now notice the degree that Jesus tells us this man went to. At the, and when he talks about purple and fine linen, he says habitually. Not just on special occasions. He habitually dressed in this extremely expensive purple, in extremely expensive fall, joyously living sumptuously, not on special occasions, but every day. Jesus is painting a very specific picture. He's going to some detail to describe this man, and he clearly does it in a negative way. He focuses not on the man's wealth, but on how the man used his wealth and portrays that in an extremely negative light. The portrait that he's really painting is one of gaudiness. It's one of a show-off. It's one of great ostentation. It's one who puts forth his tremendous wealth and riches and sort of rubs it in people's faces. And is not just celebrating, but is living, living whole hog as far as he can go, as hard as he can, every day. And then you've got verse 20. One verse later. One verse later. And a poor man named Lazarus. One of the shortcomings of the modern translations, they translate this poor man. Because we don't like the word beggar. King James translated it beggar. The word actually means one who crouches. It's the idea of a man who huddles down and has nothing of himself and can do almost nothing for himself. It's not just a man with no money. It is a man with no ability. It is a man with no ability to get what he needs for himself. He is indeed completely dependent on other people. One who crouches, one who hovers, one who has to stay out of the way because he has no power of his own. And not only that, but he's sick. He's covered in sores. The dogs come and lick these leaking sores on his body. It is a picture of unquestioned poverty and powerlessness that Jesus paints when he describes Lazarus. And notice what Lazarus wants. He draws the connection between the two. 
This man, living wearing purple and fine linen and living joyously, magnificently, radiantly every day, when he walks through his gate, here is this beggar covered in sores with dogs licking him, hoping that they sweep out the floors near him so he could get some of the crumbs. This rich man is able to walk by this beggar every day seeing a man who's just hoping to get what's swept off the floor. And he doesn't do anything about it. He doesn't reach out to him. He doesn't give him a scrum of bread. He doesn't take what was scraped off the plates and give that to him. He lets him hope for what's swept up. The things that fall from the table. Jesus is drawing an unhappy comparison between these two men. And he is roundly criticizing the way the rich man handled his wealth and treated this man at his gate. I want you to know, though, that even though Jesus said to two chapters later, chapter 18, uh, Chapter 18, verse 22, actually verse 18, where the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, What shall I do to inherit, inherit eternal life? He tells him to keep the, the prophets and the law. And the young man says, I've done all of those things. And then Jesus says, Well, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me and you will be complete. Verse uh, 22, verse 23 of Luke 18. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus looked at him and said how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The apostles are taken aback by this. Well, who can enter? Because their attitude was even more defined than ours is today, but we share much of the same attitude, which is that beggars are beggars because of their own fault. And the wealthy are wealthy because they deserve it. That's what the apostles thought. That if a rich man can't do it, who can do it? And Jesus turned that on his side. But notice when he says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven, he's not condemning wealth in itself. He's not saying that every rich person is doomed to destruction and can't do anything about it. What he says is that wealth competes with God in your life. That if you have both, most of the time, almost all the time, wealth wins. But we have several examples in Scripture where wealth doesn't win. And he goes on to say in the account of the rich, the rich young ruler... With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Say it's possible. But we have people like Joseph of Arimathea, Matthew 27, verse 57, and when Jesus dies on the cross, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea, Joseph, who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. Well, that verse, we have a rich man who did become a disciple. It is possible. Luke 8, verse 3 tells us about several women including Joanna, the wife of Cuzza, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many other women who were taken from their taking from their private means and contributing to the needs of Jesus, basically paying for him to go around and preach, as well as the apostles. We have these wealthy women, who many of whom were there at the foot of the cross when most of the apostles, all but John, had fled. We have in Luke chapter, I mean Mark, John chapter 12, Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who takes a 300 denarii a vial of nard and anoints Jesus' feet, which tells us pretty clearly that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were wealthy. We have Barnabas in Acts chapter 4 selling land, and several people who sell land and bring it to church to contribute to the needs of the saints. Jesus is not condemning wealth He's condemning the attitude of the wealthy like the rich man. And he wants us to put God first above wealth. And to realize, if you have wealth, that there is a competition 
between spirituality and physicality or wealth. There is a battle going on. And if you ignore it, if you don't pay attention to it, if you don't guard your your heart and your attitudes, it's wealth will win. But let's go to after their death here in Luke chapter 16. Verse 23. And we see more of the attitudes of the rich man once they get to the afterlife. Verse 23. Well, verse 22, they die and they both uh, go to the afterlife. Lazarus to Abraham's bosom. The rich man uh, also died in his very verse 23, talking about the rich man. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Think about this for a second. The rich man has now died. He's gone off to the afterlife, not yet in hell, not yet apparently in the pit that's pictured in Revelation, but in some intermediate state. But even in this intermediate state, he is being tormented, and not just tormented, but actually tormented in flame, which certainly foreshadows the flames of hell. But how does he look at Lazarus today? How does he look at this beggar who was poor and sick and helpless who used to lay at his gate? He says, Abraham, send Lazarus to help me out. Send Lazarus to make this better for me. Tell Lazarus to come over here and cool me off. His attitude toward Lazarus, even in torment, is Lazarus should be used for my purpose. It shows the hardness of this man's heart. He begs for mercy, but he doesn't cry out with regret. He doesn't shout out an apology, at least not that Jesus records for us. He doesn't say, I mistreated Lazarus in life. But Abraham does. Look at what Abraham says in verse 25. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you're in agony. Well, Abraham says, Look, you're both in similar circumstances as before you died. It's just the tables are turned. You didn't do anything in life. He had bad things. You gave him nothing good. And now you want him to come and give you something good? It shows the ridiculous attitude of the rich man in life. It shows the callousness with which he could treat a beggar at his gate. And it reveals, hopefully, it mirrors the own callousness that we're capable of. The own hard-heartedness that we can reflect when we look at the helpless, when we look at those who can't pick themselves up and are hoping for crumbs. But notice what else Abraham says in verse 26. Besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. Abraham says, it's too late. It's too late. It's impossible. There is a great chasm, there is a great gulf, there is a great barrier, and the crossing over from here to there, from there to here, is impossible. It will never happen. And even though the rich man could see Abraham, even though the rich man could see Lazarus, even though the rich man could talk to Abraham, he can't cross over. He sees it. He's aware of its existence. He's aware that there's a better place, but he can never get there or receive help from there. It's over. It's too late. 
Now you go back to life. And you go back to the days when they were living whatever city they were living in, and the rich man is living sumptuously every day, and he's walking by this beggar hoping for crows. And you ask me, you answer me this: which one is longer? Living sumptuously every day in your city or being tormented in a flame? That rich man, to this day, 2,000 years later, is still tormented in flame. To this day, he is still tormented in in flame. He has yet to get his tongue cooled off. Now would you rather be Lazarus or the rich man? Will you take the crumbs and the sores and the powerlessness here in exchange for the comfort there? Or will you trade the comfort there for the living sumptuously here? It's a lot longer there. It's a lot longer there. Finally, the rich man gets to somebody other than himself in verse 27. Verse 27, the rich man sees the hopelessness of his own condition and it finally occurs to him that it's only going to get worse because his loved ones are about to join him. Verse 27, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will, also, will not also come to this place of torment. Hell is full of heartbreak and regret. Hell is full of knowledge of missed opportunities. Hell is full of the realization of what you could have done and what you should have done and who you should have done it for. This rich man didn't have a positive impact on his family while he was alive. He knew that his family was headed to the same place where he found himself. And he had done nothing, apparently, or he had done nothing sufficient, obviously, to prevent them from winding up exactly where he is. And he hears the same answer that he heard when he asked for help. It's too late. It's too late. You can't help them after death. After you're gone... There will be no other opportunity for you to reach out to your family. There will be no opportunity for you to tell them the truth. There will be no further opportunity for you to help them avoid the fate of the rich man. It will be too late. And notice what Abraham says. Abraham says they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. I think Jesus is critical of this rich man all the way through. It may be unfair on my part, but the rich man continues to argue. And I admire his desire to help his family, but he is still bucking God's plan. He is still trying to get his own way, trying to dictate terms, trying to tell God how it's going to be. He's like, no, 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 not the law and the prophets. Send somebody from the dead. That'll do the trick. God's plan won't work. My plan will work. Abraham says, no. No, your plan's not going to work. Your plan's not even going to be tried. And even if we try, and we send somebody from the dead, it won't work either. If they won't listen to God, they won't listen to a resurrected man. You may be a part of that rich man's family. You may be a person who is right now rejected the law and the prophets. You may be a person who has had a resurrected man to give you proof that God will do what God says he will do. Because Jesus himself was resurrected. Jesus himself came out of that grave. Jesus himself returned from the dead and proved that there is a God and that there is a heaven and that there is a hell and there will be a reckoning. Will you pay attention? Will you pay attention? God's word is all you have. If you don't use that to instill in your family the importance of submitting to God, the importance of living God's way and treating God's creatures the way God wants them treated, you will suffer the fate of this rich man. Your family will suffer the fate of this rich man. 
Take your opportunity. Listen to the Word of God. Acknowledge the proof that God has given to you. And make that known to your family. Make them see the importance of that in your life. Make them see that. Make them see the importance of that in how you treat people and in how you treat the helpless and how you treat those who can't help themselves. If you haven't come to Christ already, if you haven't put your faith in the Word of God and in the truth of Jesus, in the truth of His resurrection and His identity, do it today. Put your faith in the one who spoke these words and in the one who came back from the dead. Confess that faith. Repent of your sins. Be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. If you need to come to Christ for the first time, if you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing.